So better MySQL Tuner. Um, MySQL Tuner, um, you can see it at www.mysqltuner.com. Uh, an overview of some MySQL, it basically, um, it will, it's kind of a quick pass through. If you're an expert DBA, it's not gonna tell you anything that you couldn't figure out by looking at the show, show variables and show status um, for a couple of minutes, but it's really just a good way to, you just kind of run it and you get everything. You don't have to do any of the calculations. It does it all for you. This is why we write scripts to do things. Um, it was written by a guy who is not me, um, and I will get, I didn't actually write down his name because I'm a dork. But it's here. So, oh, actually, I'll show you when I actually download it um, because that was part of the part of the fun was to do that. Um, so, and basically, you can kind of check for low-hanging fruit. There's a there's a lot of stuff that's not in there, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have a better MySQL tuner. And we'll show you uh, I'll show you sample output and stuff. It is free and open source. You can modify it. Um, so that's what I did. <coughs> So getting started with MySQL Tuner. Um, so annoying. I'm very sorry about this. Um, so getting started with MySQL Tuner, this is how you get started. Then you get MySQLTuner.pl and then you make it executable and then you can just run it. Now it might not have all the options and stuff like that, but even just doing this you can kind of see some of the problems with MySQL, with uh, MySQL Tuner. So I'm going to uh, copy that. I'm going to go here and I'm going to um, make this a mirror again so I can look straight. <sighs> Please come up on the screen. Otherwise, I'm going to have a very stiff neck. There's something blue in the bottom. There's a visualization problem. Can you just make a PDF and show the PDF instead? Sure. Can fix it, then I'll do that. Export as PDF. Save. I made sure to close all of my foreign websites before I did this, <laughs> so I don't know why it's doing it. Save my changes. Oh, but you can see, right, because I made this extended now. I made it the extended. Uh, extended uh, window so that I can just move this here. So, well, let me see if now it's going to do a mirror now that I closed it. There we go. Okay. So, uh, there I was. Uh, let me make sure I have internet. I have internet. Um, and I wanted to paste. So, wgetmysqltuner.pl. It's resolving it. It's saving it to mysqltuner.bl. It's just wget. I did Chamad, and so now let's run it and see what happens. And it says, please enter your MySQL administrative login. It's actually just going to look at the local host, and my local host uh, username is just root, and I don't have a password because, you know, it's my laptop. And it says, attempted to use login credentials, but they were invalid. Okay, so um, the problem here is actually that if I do MySQL u root, it actually doesn't work because I have to, um, I'm actually in a SIGWIN window and it's actually MySQL is running on Windows. So I actually have to do mysql h 127000100 right? No big deal. I do it in MySQL and I can get to it where I couldn't before. So I should be able to in mysqltuner.pl and obviously you would um, do like dash dash help and you get all the, the variables and stuff that you can do. Um, but I know that it's dash dash host, and then you do 127.0.0.1. Um, and then I can do like dash dash user root like that, uh, so it won't ask me. <laughs> Otherwise it'll say, like it did before, what's, what's your username and password. So now, okay, we get this, this thing, oh, Major Hayden is his name. Um, and uh, run with help for additional outputs and output filtering. And it says, the force mail option is required for remote connections. What do you mean remote connections? Well, here's the first problem. If you use the dash dash host option, it just assumes that you're using the remote option, which is go to a remote server and get that. And force mem is, is to hand code in how much memory the machine has, because it does some memory calculations. So it needs to know what, what the maximum level is, but it can't do, you know, like uh, cat proc CPU info to get the memory, uh, not CPU info, 
mem info. CPU info won't get won't get you won't get you uh, memory information no matter what. So here you can see I have two gigabytes of you know memory. So okay, I'm kind of pumped that it's doing that, and that's something I'll fix later, right? Because that's the whole point. But even even just trying it, it's a little fudgy. And okay, I can see why you might assume that if you're putting in a specific host, why you're probably doing it remotely. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you have more than one instance on, on a machine. Sometimes you do that. So um, so user root and then dash force mem equals not equals um, force mem uh, two zero four eight. So in the um, in the dot slash mysql tuner help. I'm gonna grab for force mem. Um, and you can see it says amount of RAM installed in megabytes. So I'm gonna say twenty forty eight. So this should work. So if it does work, it's gonna be a lot of output. So let me pipe it into more. And hopefully it'll work. It says performing tests on 127.0.0.1. Um, and you I did provide the user. There's something going on that's interesting here. Oh, let's try this. User root host force now. Force now. I believe I spelled it all correctly. Well, let's and not. You have to use a equal if you use the form no. user. I didn't before. Okay, well let's try, I'll try equals. I mean, I did uh, all the examples, you know, a few days ago and it was fine. It's just odd. I'm logging into the database. Yeah, mysql dash u root dash h127 dot Okay, can I Probably the, when you... Anyway. Um, oh, when I changed everything? No, when you uh, brought up the, the computer from uh, okay. standby. No, because I already have logged, logged in. So the server yeah. is, is working? It's all right. I will... Uh, here, see, my SQL is not started. Okay, that mm -hmm. helps. But it was before, because I showed you before that when I was doing the host examples, that we had to log in. All right, so when in doubt, is it plugged in? There, see, now it's already. So that's another thing, right? It couldn't connect because the port wasn't open, and so it's asking me for, for my login again. You know, it's, it's like these little things that you probably won't find 95% of the time using it, but I tend to find this stuff. So you can see, okay, we got past the, the, the 127.0.1, 0 0.1 through 306. So to make it easier, I actually have put this into the slides, which I have made a PDF because we think it might help. Okay, and page down. All right. So um, I'm going to go right over the output quickly. So if you have a question, feel free to ask it. But I might talk about something later, like, oh, how to calculate that? Because uh, some of the calculations aren't completely right. Like it does a, here's the total memory that it might ever use, and it's got like four variables in it. And there's tons of other variables that, you know, there's lots of little things like a, you know, TCP net stack buffer that's like 196K or something for every connection that goes. There's a lot, there's a lot of little things. So, you know, feel free to say things that should be changed. Like, for instance, dash dash host 127.0.01 shouldn't require force map unless that was completely remote. Um, one thing that I do want to say now um, before anyone asks me about it is that I will put the slides up and the software will actually be up. But I wanted to wait until after this session because if people had ideas of something to fix in it, I didn't want to have like software and then, you know, whatever. So if it's something that I can fix in a day or two, then I'll just put it up and whatever. And I'm also trying to figure out like, are we going to put it on launch pad? Are we going to, how are we going to do it? So I think it's, I'm, I'm going for launch pad. So. Um, so feel free to definitely, you know, raise your hand or just shout out and be like, oh, that's wrong. But uh, if I don't explain it, I will explain it later. So. Can you guys see that? So here's an example output from this. So this is what we just saw, performing tests. So then it says, uh, here's a red exclamation points, successfully authenticated with no password. That's a security risk. OK, that's bad. Great, I'm glad it let us know that. OK, it's assuming 20, 48 megabytes of physical memory. And you see this dash, dash? That's actually blue. You can't, I can barely see it on my screen. It's blue. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but that's kind of neutral. So it's dash, dash, it's blue. 
um, assuming zero megabytes of swap space, use dash dash four swap to, swap to specify. Oh, well, I'm just using this for the first time. I didn't know I had to specify four swapped. I didn't even know that four swap was an option. I just ran it like it said it told me to, which was to run mysql tuner.pl and see what happened. So, you know, that's something else that I, I, have, I have actually changed in the new one is that if you're using force mem, you have to use force swap too, because that's just how it goes. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of like the beginning. Then there's some general statistics. So general statistics. It skipped the version check for MySQL Tuner. So this is kind of neat. What it will do is it will go out to the internet. If you um, use the dash dash check version, I think it's check version, um, it will actually go out to the internet and see if it's the most recent version of MySQL Tuner because more recent versions will have more things in it. Um, and it's actually especially important when you get to this. So it says, I don't know, can you guys see this? Green okay? Yeah. It's green and it's light green and that's how it shows up on the screen. So um, it is green, it says okay. So we've got neutral, bad, and good, right? Green for good, red for bad, and blue for neutral. Currently running supported MySQL version 5.1.35 dash community. Who wants to take a guess at how it knows what's currently supported? It's hard coded in it. Um, which, which I was like, oh, that's really bad. But on the one hand, how are you going to do that? You're going to go to like the the lifecycle page and try to paste it and grab it. And I said, you know, that's actually probably pretty acceptable, especially since you can just choose not to skip the version check for MySQL Tuner script, right? So if you have the, if I could select just what I wanted. If you have the most recent version of MySQL Tuner script, chances are you're going to have the most recent list of what's actually supported. So I, I think that's a reasonable compromise rather than trying to somehow magically know dynamically what's supported and what's not. So let's get into some more interesting things. Storage en engine statistics. So this is actually kind of interesting. It has a blue dash dash that's neutral, right? But then it has red. It does, you don't have archive, you don't have BDB, you don't have federated, you don't have ISOM, you don't have NDB cluster, and you do have EnoDB. Now they don't say anything about my ISOM because you have to have my ISOM. Um, I think for whatever reason, I think it would be just good to see it in there. I, I don't think I've even put it in there, but I think most people forget that they, even if they're like, oh, we're 100% EnoDB. Well, not 100%. Um, so, and then it gets some data size. Data in EnoDB table, 16K, there's one table. Now, this is my, you know, my test scenario. So if we go to uh, dashu dashi 227 and we do show databases, and if I spell it correctly, then we'll see I have information schema, MySQL, next gen, and test. So if I do um, select uh, table name, table schema, engine, from information schema, dot tables, where schema, not table schema, table, schema not in information schema, and I should quote that. So basically what I'm saying is show me all the tables, all their names all, of all the tables and all the databases and their storage engines. Um, there's only two, so it's going to take longer to write this query than actually do it, but I like to, I like to prove things to people. Um, information schema, and then um, MySQL. So I don't want what's in the MySQL database, I don't want what's in information schema. So I have two tables. One is called primary key hash, and it's a MySQL table, and one's called clients, and it's an EnoDB table. So the clients is what has 16K in it. So what um, under the hood, what uh, MySQL Tuner is doing is it goes to the information schema and says, give me your data length. Not your index length, just the data length. Which, I mean, you might, it, it does say what's the size of the data in EnoDB, EnoDB tables, but most people care about what's the size of the data and indexes together. So again, it's kind of literally true, right, your data, but that's kind of irrelevant when the data indexes, especially when you know, you them together. You know, you can't separate data and indexes, so. Um, and then it will have it for, uh, for other, for, it doesn't do it for my ISOM tables, which is kind of silly because my ISOM statistics are exact, so it should be good. Um, so now it says total fragmented tables, one, okay. So I went in the code and I looked and I'm like, well, how's it? That's pretty cool, fragmented table. We all want to know are our, table, our tables fragmented? You know, and, and so what is it doing? Well, it's going and it's looking to see if the data free is greater than one. So, or greater than zero. 
So if I do select um, like you know data length and then data free and this stuff, so data free here it's zero on this MyISIM table. Um, and then it's 419, on the EnoDB table. Well, why is it, uh, I think that's 4 meg, 419, 304, 494, 304, divided by 1 or 2 bytes, k megs. So yeah, it's 4 megs. There's 4 megabytes free. Does that mean that there's 4 megabytes of defragmentation? No, my database is 16 kilobytes big. That's how big the data was in, in data length, if we go back to here, right? The size of the data is 16K. Now, sure, it's possible that I put in four megabytes of data and deleted it all but 16K, but I know I didn't. I just kind of put in a test. So why does it? Why is it saying it's fragmented? It's saying it's fragmented because the test is if data free is bigger than zero. Data free is bigger than zero here because if I do um, show, actually, use test, show table status, or I could just use information schema and do the same thing. Um, Oh, it's not in the comment anymore. But basically, data free is the amount of um, data that's left in the EnoDB, um, the EnoDB file, the data in the index file. So if table I space. Huh? table space, right? Table space. So it would make sense if you had file per table option. If I had file per table option, would it still make sense? Um, it would, but. Mm -hmm. It's still, sometimes it's still something like 4K even after mm -hmm. you optimize. You know, it's just kind of, it's about to grow or, you know, because it has a minimum block size that when it, you know, when it allocates, if you have uh, two bytes of data to put in, it doesn't allocate two bytes. It gets a block mm -hmm. or whatever it is. You can change the, the min, min res unit if you want. Um, so sometimes it's, you know, a lot of times I'll see it's, you know, 4K or something. You know, a four meg, something kind of small, not a big deal when you've got 20 gigs of data, but that check would, would, it would call it fragmented. Um, so, for instance, this table isn't really fragmented. If I optimize table test.clients, okay, table doesn't support optimize, doing recreate and analyze instead. That, that was still recreating it, will still uh, take any of the fragmentation out if there was fragmentation. So now if I do. Uh, show table status, right? I have a d data free of still four megabytes because the EnoDB table space that's there is is bigger. Um, so if I do uh, show global variables like EnoDB, uh, what is it? Um, file data path or something? EnoDB percent file percent. EnoDB data file path. There's ten megabytes in the IB data one. Um, and I have, I do in fact have EnoDB file per table off. So um, let's see what happens. Since I've only got one EnoDB ta per, um, table, I can, uh, I can answer your question. Um, what would happen if I, if I change it to EnoDB file per table? And uh, actually, you know, let me answer that at the end because I have to shut it down and restart it. And, um, but basically, you would, you would still, you might still see a little bit. Um, of stuff, but it is good. And actually, what I would recommend, and, and one of the plans, I haven't done this yet with uh, my SQL tuner. One of the plans is to actually do a better um, defragmentation check. One of the things you can do, especially if you have um, EnoDB file per table on, is you can look at the size on disk, and then you can compare it with the size in the information schema. Now, the size in the information schema is approximate, but you could make a threshold of say, if it's more than 20% difference or 10% different then it's probably defragmented. You know, if it's you know two percent different, that might just be the estimation different difference. And the idea that I have would be to have the thresholds you you would set the threshold. So because you know we all we all know that we need to optimize our tables, but you know, you might not know how often do I really delete you know, I know that there's code to delete and I know that they happen, but how often does it happen? You know, I don't want to have to go trolling through the binary logs and counting. You know, how, how often does it happen, for, and even, you know, how often does it happen for this one table? So that's uh, storage engine statistics, and then there's a whole screen on performance. This is still the output of MySQL tuner. So it's got a neutral, here's how long it's been up for. It's been up for 6 hours, 26 minutes, 34 seconds, um, which was what it was when I did it. Obviously now it's been up like 2 minutes. Um, and uh, 50 queries, and it's 0.002 queries per second. 26 connections, 
um, 27,000 connections and uh, uh, 27,000 transactions and 2,000 of them are reads. So the reads, there's 100% reads and no writes because I'm just playing around with it really. Um, total buffers is 34 megs global plus 2.7 megs per thread. There's 151 max threads. Like I said, they do this total buffers thing and they, you know, they don't, you know, do I have a BDB um, log size set? Do I have, there's no other, you know, all they're doing is, is taking the global, adding them up, like the key buffer size and the, you know, to be the pool and the sort buffer size, things like that. Um, kind of like the formula when you go to MySQL's website and you see like the formula with six variables. It's really a lot more complicated than that, but those are like the six major ones, so that's kind of the easier thing to do. But if you have a really high transaction system um, with a lot of stuff going on, sometimes those little things really add up. So it's like you might as well put it in if you can because it won't affect the people who don't need it, but it really will affect the people who do. So this is okay, maximum possible memory usage, taking this 2.7 megs per thread and multiplying it by 151 max threads. Um, if every single thread that could possibly connect to MySQL connected and used the maximum amount of memory they could, I would still use only 439.8 megs of memory, of RAM. Now, that you, this is not a production system. Usually in a production system, you would want that. You would, wanna, you would want it to be over 100% because you're not actually going to have all of your threads using join buffers and sort buffers. You know, they're not doing 70 things at once, right? Each, there might be one that's doing a big file sort and one that's doing a big join and then seven other ones that are doing short little queries. You know, so if you tuned, it, tuned your memory usage so that you would never go over that 100%, you might actually have some... Um, you have, you're being very conservative and so you're having some memory that you could be using for other things. Um, you obviously don't want to get into the danger zone though because if it crashes then you know you could have corrupt data and that's nobody wants that. So um, so it says it's okay here but again it's one of those if it's over it'll say oh it's too much RAM you have to decrease everything you know and it's like well you know sometimes that's okay so I would like to be able to set this threshold you know maybe don't go over a certain, you know, don't go over 10% of what I actually have. Um, and it also, you know, it also depends on how many threads you have. Like a lot of people just set their max connections to be 5,000. Because the thing about max connections is that you don't want, um, the reason that you have max connections is that so you don't have so many connections that are using so much memory that then MySQL crashes. Because crashing is bad and, and bad and cause corruption. So better to deny extra requests than to crash. However, in this web 2.0 day and age, a crash, okay, corruption's bad, but you know, a lot of times MySQL comes up and it's great. And to your customers, it's the same thing, whether they, it crashes or whether you get max connections exceeded because they can't use the app. So a lot of people will just say, you know, we're gonna make sure that we're okay within our bounds and we're gonna put you know, 5,000. And so then this calculation comes out to be you know, 2.7 times 5,000, of course it's gonna go over. So actually, one of the things that um, that I did with the new with the newer script is I left this calculation in, but I also took the max threads used. Um, there's a there's a status variable of how many were actually used. So for instance, if I do it here, it's going to be like two or one, because there's only ever been one or two connections at a time. So these people that have five thousand, they might have two hundred connections at once, and that's a more realistic number to say. What if all of the ones who actually connected? Not all the ones that could theoretically possibly connect. Sure, in a denial of service attack, you could get that. But you know, trying to get a more realistic feel. Um, slow queries, zero percent, zero out of fifty total queries when I did this. So that's great. Um, one of the questions that I had when I started digging through the source code was, well, when is it bad? How many how many percentage of slow queries is bad? You know, it's the same thing as the. More than zero. Uh, there's a percentage. I think it's ten uh, percent. But like here, you know, you have total fragmented tables one. Why did it flag it as red here? Is it because there's one? Is it because it's half the number of tables? You know, I went in and I think it's actually, um, I think it's actually one. I have my notes here, I could look at them. Um, do I? No, I know what I did. Uh, I, I wrote it out later is what I did. Because I had the questions and then I just answered them in the slides. So I'm doing what I told you guys I would do is to say I'm doing it later. So, 
highest usage of available connections. So they already have this highest usage of available connections is 2%, 4 out of 151. Right? So that's a whole lot better when, when you start worrying about, oh my god, we're using 5,000 times the amount of memory we have. No, you're, you're not. Um, key buffer size divided by total myosin indexes. Um, this is good, but it, if you don't really know, like you have to think about this for a second, like what, what does that mean? Okay, I have the key buffer and then over the total indexes. Oh, it's telling me how much kind of a, of a percentage of the indexes will fit into the buffer size total. But it would be a whole lot easier if they said like efficiency of, you know, how much of the, I don't know, like, you know, the unit of the buffer pool size, right? It's the key buffer size divided by the indexes. So this is okay, again, what's not okay. So, you know, I'm doing all that kind of looking through and, you know, if you only have one my isom table, how much do you really care about the key buffer size in general? So the other, another thing that I'd like to do is to be able to um, have basically an API to say, you know what, I don't care about these variables and I really care about these variables. You know, and you could have like a configuration um, file or something, you know, I don't know, you could write in XML if you wanted, I probably wouldn't go that way, but, um, but to have to have something like that, so that you're not going to, you know, maybe you don't have the slow query uh, engine turned with the slow query it's turned on. But for this is what it would be good to, to have uh, an access log from an application which tables you really do use, mm -hmm. because you may have thousands of tables in your database, but your application only uses five or so. Uh, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now it's uh, giving me it's giving me to, uh, two red bangs that the query cache is disabled. Well, the query cache isn't uh, you know your magic button of do everything great. So you know again it's kind of like I see where the idea is coming from. Like oh you probably should have the query cache on, but maybe I disabled it on purpose or maybe I never turned it on. You know. So again this threshold is hard coded. If it's not on, it wants it to be on. Um, so this is actually the last page of of um, performance stuff, and then there's just recommendations. So. I know it's kind of slogging through it, but it's, it is actually great that you get all this information in what's already there. So, you know, we're actually going to make this better. So you have sorts requiring temporary tables is okay, there's zero. So there were zero temporary sorts out of how many actual sorts. Okay. Um, temporary tables created on disk. Again, it's good, zero on disk, and there were nine temporary tables created total. Okay. You know, that will tell you if you need to have your um, memory parameters increase for the um, size of... Uh, the temporary tables that you can have in memory. Because as once you start running to disk, you start getting file I.O. And so if you have a lot of very big temporary tables, you end up spending a lot more time in queries because you're waiting, not only you're waiting for the sorting to happen, but then it has to write to disk to be able to sort because it exceeds the maximum amount of uh, results that you can have in memory before it writes to the disk. And so you can increase that parameter, um, but you don't want to increase it too much because you don't want all of your threads to grab all that memory and and, uh, and then crash the server because you've used too much memory. Um, so thread cache is disabled and uh, it's giving me exclamation points. That's probably a good point. The thread cache is it's a very small amount of data and it basically gets rid of a lot of connection overhead if you just, once you close a connection, it, the, um, the, the um, stuff goes back into the, the thread cache so that you don't have to reinitialize the connection. Um, table cache hit rate. So this is the table cache. The table cache is uh, similar to the thread cache, but it's you know with your tables. When you stop using a table, are you going to close the table or you, you leave it open? Things like that. So the table cache hit rate, once you, uh, it's 6% here. Um, there's one total that's open now. And there were 16 total tables that I opened. Now, I don't even have 16 tables, so this is, you know, I've actually accessed 16 different tables, or 16 tables, you know, so I might access the same one. Um, so this is actually flagging, you know, that this is a problem because I should, if I'm, there's only one table open, but I've opened 16, I should be able to keep 16 in memory. You know, 16 of these, what are they, pointers or something to the table cache? It's just the... Memory table structure. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to open it again. Um, open file limit used. So how many open files can you have at once? I wasn't using any. The limit is 755, so that's okay. Table locks acquired immediately, 100%. That's good to see. 
again, when, when does it warn? I want it to be flexible, but you know, it's actually hard-coded. Um, let's see what it's hard-coded to. Um, what was I looking for again over here? Table locks. Table locks acquired immediately. And uh, if uh, if it's so, if you have five percent are not acquired immediately, if you have less than ninety-five percent that are acquired immediately, then it will give you uh, you know give you give you a uh, give you a, a you know, that's not okay. You know, again, you should be able to control that. And certainly, it should at the very least, um, let me show this to you again. It should at the very least be a variable, not this magic number of 95 sitting right here. At the, at the very least, it should be like a number at the top so that, you know, you can go in and change it. But this is just, if it's less than 95, you know, random magic number. I don't like magic numbers. And, you know, to be data size divided by the buffer pool, again, it's kind of like the index. You have to think about it for a little OK. So how much of the data can fit into the buffer pool? Um, I have 16.0K okay out of 8 megs. So most people are going to have, this is um, less than 1, which means that if, if it's less than 1, it means, if it's less than or equal to 1, it means all your data will fit into the, the, the buffer pool. Most people are going to have it greater than 1. Um, that's just how it is. And then it's going to probably flag it as not OK. Um, which, you know, what are you going to do? Increase your data pool size to 300 gigabytes if that's your data? Um, yeah, not really realistic, but, it, you know, when this was written, it probably was more realistic. Who knows? So here's the, the, uh, the last page, and these are the recommendations. And this is actually really neat. It summarizes what it wants you to do. So here's the general recommendations. Rop run optimized table, defragment tables for better performance. All of them? Really? You want me to just, oh yeah, let me just optimize table and do run a locking query on all my tables. No problem. That's great. For ones that don't even need it because it might just be that they have room in the table space for other reasons. So, um, again, it's kind of good advice, but you're also, this is geared not towards, you know, somebody who's going to say, oh, I know that that's not a good idea to do. Somebody might be doing this because they're like, well, I don't really know and I'm going to use this tool. Um, so, it, uh, the other thing it that it doesn't do is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you any warnings, doesn't say, oh, run optimized table, and that's a, you know, careful, because that's a blocking query. That'll take your databases offline. Um, and uh, if, if you did something like if you had EnoDB file per table and you were comparing the table's size on disk to the table, to the approximate table size and information schema, you could actually say, this table is, you know, 50% different from it. So it's really a big, a big deal. And that's actually, by the way, how you see defragmentation on a my ISIM table, because my ISIM is exact. So if your size of your data file, your data length in information schema is any different from your data length on disk, then you have fragmentation. And I've seen, I mean, I've seen, you know, that the uh, that the information schema has like 16 megabytes, and on disk it's you know four megabytes. You know, it's crazy. I mean, that's not a crazy amount. It's only 12 megabytes. But um, if there's any difference because the the statistics are exact you know right away. So that's actually, I think it's a better way to do that. Um, and certainly you would be able to say, hey, these are the tables. This is the one that has the most fragmentation. This is the one that has the least fragmentation. My, and now here it gives me, it says MySQL was started within the last 24 hours. Remember, this has been up for six hours. So the recommendations may be inaccurate. Um, things like open tables. You know, the second, if you have a table cache of 300, the first 300 tables that open are going to go into the table cache. And you're going to not get a very good hit rate because the cache hasn't warmed up yet. Um, so that's, that's good that it's telling you that. Um, it wants me to enable the slow query log to troubleshoot bad queries. Well, um, I know I don't have bad queries, so I don't turn the slow query log on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't turn it on because I don't need to. So again, it's kind of saying, well, you have to turn, you know, I want you to turn it on. Just always turn it on. Now, that's a good idea probably for 95% of the people, but not everybody, you know, wants to do that. Um, set thread cache size to four as a starting value. Four is a magic number. It just is like, oh, your thread cache is set to zero, so I, you should increase it to something. Um, it would be nice if it actually looked at, I don't know, max use threads and said, you should set it to, well, my max use threads was four, but uh, four is actually, I did actually look it up. Um, so, what was the exact wording here? Uh, thread cache size. Thread cache size. Set thread cache size to four as a starting value right here. 
So it's not it did, just a coincidence the maximum value happened to be 4. This is the script, and it says, you know, if, if the thread cache size is 0, that's bad. So set the thread cache size to 4, and then, you know, and then work your way up and, and go incrementally. So, you know, it's not awful advice for, you know, 90% of the organizations out there, but it's probably for the, you know, one company it's bad for, it's really bad for. And then it says increase table cache gradually to avoid file descriptor limits. Okay, and then it gives me a list of variables for just query cache size, make that greater than 8 megs because it wants me to turn the query cache on. It doesn't say, and here's the other thing, it doesn't say, turn the query cache on. Here's how you do it. Turn the query cache size to, to this. It also doesn't tell me if this is dynamic or not. So I have, there's no, and there's no sense of priority. So I have no idea, is this easy to do? Is it low-hanging fruit? I don't know. You know, it could be something that I need to restart with. Um, thread cache size, start at four. Again, four is just kind of magic. Table cache greater than 64. Really? I have two tables. Why do I need a table cache greater than 64? 64 is a magic number. So here's, uh, you know, in a nutshell, the features of MySQL Tuner. You can get the up-to-date version with wget, like we just got the wget mysql tuner.pl, which is pretty cool. Um, you can set dash dash check version to check the version. The color, the blue, green, red color schema, you can turn off with no color. And then the remote option is pretty cool because you don't have to be on the server you're checking. You do need to have the information of the memory and the swap because it will actually do some, some checks there. Um, it is easy to read and understand. Um, it's, there's a lot there, but uh, but you know you can give this. You know if you're a DBA, you can give this to your boss, and you can be like, look, the maximum possible memory usage is 4339. That's 21 percent of you know. So easy, even a manager can understand it. And I say that because I'm a manager. Um, and it gives percentages and raw numbers. So it doesn't just say, you know, oh my god, 21% of your install RAM is being used, you know, because if you had 64 gigabytes of RAM, it wouldn't be a big deal that 21% is used. But if you have one gigabyte of RAM, that might be a big deal, you know? It all depends on, sometimes percentages are better, sometimes numbers are better. So I say that because, you know, now that I've given you the good things, I'm gonna give you the issues. So, um, remember it complained about the password security? It didn't put that in the summary. Now, that's not a big deal when you're reading a page of text, but they put everything else in the summary. Why don't they put that? And that's probably the most important thing. They probably, in fact, they probably shouldn't let you run it unless you actually have a password, but whatever. But that's me. Um, so remember it said that it was a security risk and didn't put it in the summary. That's kind of a, a little niggly thing. The fragmentation uh, check is incorrect. That's what I was saying before. If data free is, is greater than zero, then uh, it's fragmented, which can be true, but it doesn't have to be. The, there's actually a disk size feature, so I pulled this actually from a different machine um, that we had already done one on. Um, so if you look, this this uh, machine had didn't have ARC, didn't have BDB, didn't have federated. We saw this. We saw data. We didn't see data in my ISIN tables. Uh, I think this is actually a newer version because I, I don't think we saw BDB and federated in in, um, in the one I did. So I'm not sure if it looks to see if it's. Uh, um, in the version of MySQL or not, because 5.1 doesn't have BDB or federated in it. So I think it looks to see if it has the have BDB and have federated. And then if those options don't even exist, it just doesn't put it in there at all. Which, you know, again, that, it's up to you whether you might want to know about it or not, because you don't have it. You know, it's, it's not in the server at all, so you don't even have the option of having it, but you might want to know. So you don't sit there going, we should use federated tables. And then, come, you know, you go to do it and you can't use it because it's not even in the server. Um, so yeah, data in my ISIM tables, and then tables nine, that's pretty useful. There's nine tables. Um, you know, here's data in you know, B tables, 89 gigs, tables 123, data in memory tables, again, this is a different server. Total fragmented tables is 45. Well here, now we have nine plus three is 12, and 100, it's like 100, and almost 150, and we've got 45. So we've got about a third of the tables. You know, so, you know, so then I go here and I say, okay, total fragmented. And okay, if frag tables is greater than zero. So if you have even one table fragmented, heaven forbid, you have one table fragmented, it's going to complain and then it won't even tell you which tables are fragmented. So yeah, I mean, we all know we need to fragment, defragment our tables. Um, and you know, it's only on my laptop that you don't see any fragmentation because you know, I drop tables when I'm done with them. So, um, the other thing is uh, for, the, for the data length, for this amount of data, it uses uh, approximate. 
you know, uses approximate, doesn't tell you it's approximate, just says, here's the amount of data, 89 gigs, but it might really be like 85 gigs, which might make all the difference. Um, we also care about the index length, as I was saying. Um, which, you know, on an 89 gigabyte table, you probably have like a 30 gigabyte index file at least. I mean, you could have a 100 gigabyte index file, it depends on how many indexes you have. So if there are some inaccurate assumptions, it assumes query cache being off is bad, it always recommends slow, doing the slow query log on, but it doesn't actually show you long query times. It says show, sh uh, it says turn the query cache, it says turn the slow query log on so that you can see bad queries. But it doesn't tell you how bad they are. I mean, it defaults, MySQL defaults to 10 seconds being the long query time, which means that if a query is greater than 10, takes greater than 10 seconds, it will be logged in the slow query log. I don't know about you, but when's the last time you waited more than maybe three or four seconds for a page to load before you just went away from it? I mean, 10 seconds is a really long time, unless you have a reporting server. And if you have a reporting server, 10 seconds is probably too short um, if you're doing a lot of data warehousing queries. So again, it's kind of giving you half the story. Um, remote mode is assumed with dash s host, we talked about that, but actually even with dash dash host equals local host, it just assumes that you're doing it. Um, and if you do remote, it doesn't actually check the, the architecture or the disk size, which is actually really important because if it had seen the architecture, you would have seen, I don't know if you can see this, the switch to 64-bit OS, MySQL cannot currently use all of your RAM. So there's kind of, there's that's one of the other things that it'll check, it'll check to see if um, you have uh, more than two gigabytes of RAM, or more than four gigabytes of RAM, and if you have more than four gigabytes of RAM, it will actually, and you have 32-bit, it will actually give you this warning, um, which would have been nice to know, but if I do it remotely, I'm never gonna get that. So I actually put a uh, parameter called force arch, you know, force architecture, so that I could say, okay, uh, here's the memory, here's the swap, and here's the architecture, so it's 32-bit, it's 64-bit. Does it connect with the socket file? Does it connect with the socket file? It can. Um, and that's what it will do um, by default. But I have a Windows machine, and then I'm running it from SigWin. So I could log into a machine and show you that it, it does a socket. But yeah, it, it uh, defaults to local host. So it's also not flexible. The thresholds are hard-coded magic numbers. You know, uh, the sorts required in temporary tables is bad if it's over 10% total sorts. You know, maybe you do a lot of sorts. I don't know. You know, maybe you want it to be less than than 10%. You want a warning on um, the memory formula. The thread cache size is a magic number of four to start. We saw that. And then um, here it says if if long query time is greater than 10, it actually is going to recommend that you set it to less than 10. Well, thanks. But if it's greater than 10, it defaults to 10. So if it's greater than 10, it means somebody explicitly set it to be greater than 10 which probably means they had a good reason for it. Maybe the reason is no longer valid, but wouldn't it just be better to show and say, hey, here's your long query time, just in case you didn't know. This is what you're gonna flag, as opposed to saying, oh, we recommend you change this. So then there's some little niggly things. Um, if you look at the source code, the, uh, the, table, the parameter table cache actually became parameter table open cache in 5.1, and it actually, when it's checking through the variables, it actually you know, says, oh, if, if it's before 5.1, look at table cache. If it's after 5.1, look at table open cache. But when it recommends, it recommends for table cache. Again, little niggly things, but it, I don't know, it annoys me. Um, here's something that's a little, but it actually throws me off, but it might not throw everybody off. It uses K, M, and G for kilobytes, megabytes, and gigabytes, so 1024 bytes and 1024 times 1024, you know. And then it uses K, M, and B for 1,000, million, and billion. So um, back here, let me get back there, here, where it says TX 27K, RX 2K. That's 27,000 and 2,000. It's not 2048. So that can get a little, you know, I don't know. I don't see a reason to use K instead of KB. You're not saving that much space. Um, and it's especially weird because some people think M is gonna be 1,000, you know, or I don't know. It's, it's, again, it's a little niggly thing, but I think it's important. And then recommendations aren't prioritized and there's no weight given to them. So it's not, there's, there's no like, okay, this is, this you should do right now because it's really important and this is not so important, but you probably should do it and this over here is really important and it's easy to do. Um, things like saying, yes, this is a dynamic query or hey, this defragmentation will lock your tables up would be important to know. So um, here's another example output. I'll do it really quickly. Um, 
you have uh, reads writes. This is the same thing it was before. Oh, did I? Oh, I know what I did. I, I went back in my slides. There we go. Um, so here's actually some more recommendations from a different one so you can see some things. Um, the things in bold are, are what I wanted to put out. It says, reduce your overall MySQL memory footprint for st system stability. This is just something that had that, uh, you know, it was 120% of its actual memory if every connection went and got the amount of memory. So it says, hey, reduce your overall MySQL memory footprint. Reduce or eliminate persistent connections to reduce connection usage. So basically saw there were a lot of idle connections and a lot of connections were saying, so it's saying, oh, don't use persistent connections. That's not really such a good recommendation. I mean, you know, query cache limit, uh, it wants you to change, it, it says use smaller result sets or make your query cache bigger. Um, and it's basically taking the number of queries that weren't cached, you know, probably due to size. Um, and it wants the unity you know, buffer pool size to be greater than 89 gigs, which, okay, no problem. Because, it, I mean, it's looking at the size of the total thing. It's like, well, you know, you really should have another, you know, you should have about 90 gigs in your, you know, you have a pool size, which is great, but it makes me want to kick the computer. Um, other desired features, uh, I love the human readability, but sometimes you want machine readable information. I would love to go to all my servers once a month, run the script, put it in a spreadsheet, and say, wow, we're really decreasing in our, you know, amount of queries we're handling per second. Is that because we're getting fewer queries? What, how can we correlate this to that? Um, sometimes you want a really remote mode, and this is actually why I started on this, because uh, we, we've gotten some people who wanted us to uh, do an audit of their system without ever logging in. So like, well, what, whatever you want, we'll send it to you. Like, okay, so we're like, uh, I don't know, show table status, show, you know, show, show status, show variables, give us like some SAR output, some IOSTAT output, you know, like, and we literally were doing this in remote mode, like not even logging into the machines. So the remote mode that they have here, um, it doesn't, it can't get to the memory, but it still logs into the database. So one of the, the first thing I did actually, which was kind of a bigger project than some of these little like fix the formulas, was to be able to give it a file for a status and a file for variables, the show, um, show global status and show global variables, to actually just slurp that in and, and do it from there, which made my life a whole lot easier than having to look at every single um, one of those uh, things. And then sometimes um, you want all the information instead of staying silent if something is okay. So when I was uh, pulling up some examples, I saw that uh, one example had joins performed without indexes, you know, 580,000. We didn't see any joins performed without indexes in mine. And you'll see in the script, it's like, oh, well, if there are none, just don't even mention it. You know, but sometimes you want to know there's nothing going on, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, so again, having, being able to have that like API to say this is what I care about, this is what I don't, is pretty useful. Um, other desired features, I'd love to have some information on deadlocks and how many times you had a you know, dirty page and how long it was until that dirty page was written to disk. Um, show if a variable to change is dynamic, that's important, we talked about that. Um, check etsy.my.cnf for deprecated variables. That's not too hard. Again, that would be a hard-coded list or something, but say, hey, if, you know, table open cache. If you actually have a table cache, in your um, in your pro in your NCMI.CNF, you should change that. Um, and then more complex checks, such as you know trying to figure out, okay, well, is this a slave server? If it is, um, what's the is is it does it also have a slave attached to it? Maybe it's master master. Check auto increment variables. This is kind of you know wish list. It's not easy to do, but that's an example of some of the more complex stuff that I think would be really interesting to do because a lot of times we'll find people have implemented master master. And they don't have a lot of um, these auto increment variables set, which means they could have auto increment collisions, which is not good. So, uh, so what did I do? MySQL tuner file.pl is uh, is what I created because I wanted to be able to kind of look back and forth between them. The goal was to add functionality transparently, um, which was kind of difficult because I had numbers and I wanted to basically one of the things I wanted to do was make it machine readable. So I wanted to have a column of like, okay, this is good, this is bad. Here's the number, and then here's the value which doesn't jive with uptime equals six hours, nine minutes, and three seconds, and this many read transactions all on one line. So um, the way that I kind of hacked the script to do it, I, I want to actually change that. Um, but what I did was I added these uh, five parameters. Um, stat file and var file is to take in those files that I was talking about. Force arch is to show what it is. Dash dash spreadsheet will make it into the spreadsheet machine readable and dash dash debug, which uh, I just started adding the last time I worked on it, so it's uh, not completely there. But there's no debugging information you saw when I was trying to connect. 
to uh, to it, and MySQL wasn't even running, and it wanted my authentication information, even though I gave it the username. You know, so some debugging information might be nice there. So we now have a completely offline mode, and what happens basically is if you do this and you put it into vars.txt, and you show global status, and you put it into status.txt, um, then you'll get that. So for the sake of for the sake of brevity, I have that here, but you can see. It's just status.txt, and actually, I can do it for uh, nope. uh, for show global status. So dash u root show global status into status.txt, and it can't actually connect because it's probably down again because I probably killed it again. But anyway, if I just oh man, I can't believe that. Um, oh, I know why I did that actually because it's dash h127.0.0.1. All right, so um, that's not the right thing. This is, so here's actually the command that I ran. This is actually my goal when I started this was to Perl MySQL tuner file PM, okay, force mem, this is actually the amount of memory that that server had. Force swap, I'm adding the swap in. Force arch is 32, because it was actually 32 bit. Here's the var file and the, the variables in the status file. And um, you end up getting similar output and it never has to log into anything, um, but only if it actually will copy and paste properly. I know, I know, we're getting, this is, we're very close to the end anyway. Um, and then, browse the text. All right, so now we get some information here, you know, it's, very similar. Again, I used. I tried to make it transparent. I did actually change um, change some things. Like I took out if it wasn't running slow query logs. Um, what else did I do? Um, yes, yeah, so here's 219 percent of installed RAM. So that's obviously why it's not good. Um, so here I have key read requests, and I have zero. And you can see no queries have run that would use keys. That's extra information I added because. That might not be, you know, is that a problem that you have no key read requests, or is it okay? Here it's okay because there weren't any that would use it because this is mostly my, it's mostly, you know, DB. Um, upgrade to 64 bit OS, I actually added that MySQL can only use approximately 3.4 gigs of your total RAM of 16 gigs. So this machine had 16 gigs of RAM on it, it was totally dedicated to MySQL, but it had 32 bit OS, so it was a waste. So anyway, this is the kind of stuff I've added. Um, if we want to add dash spreadsheet, you can see how much the data actually changes. Um, I like to uh, separate things by pipes um, because commas you might actually use. So you can see you've got you know info bad. There are some good things. So you know here's how many bytes you received because you might want some things. We have uh, uptime, but we also have readable uptime. So I wanted it both ways. So you could say okay, uptime is 43 minutes, but it's also you know 70,000 seconds or whatever it is. Um, so I do have some of these things where you have readable and then just, you have human readable and machine readable. Um, so here, we've got total, possibly mem total possible memory used is, you know, I don't even know, I, w I don't know what that is, but hey, 34.8 gigs, that I can understand. Um, so, and that's the same thing, it's giving us the same recommendations here. So again, trying to do transparently, but also trying to add in all the features that I, uh, that I personally wanted. Um, so dash dash spreadsheet, again, doesn't use color, has more information, so those are recommendations. Then that way you can compare over a time period. Um, this will actually require uh, force swap if remote is used. The other one just required force mem. Um, skip size, now only skips the size of the tables, not the whole storage engine section. So before, if you actually put the skip size in there, or if you're doing it remotely, it skips the size, um, it would actually just skip the whole storage engine section. Um, so my biggest future desires are an API to set your own thresholds and algorithms, getting rid of all those fancy magic numbers, having a debug mode and uh, better error and failure methods. Um, and then behind the scenes, actually looking at the source code, there's a lot of similar actions that be, can be combined, like making the K versus the B for millions. Yeah, there's actually two different functions. One is you know dividing by 1024 and one is dividing by 1000. It's the same thing. It's saying if you're over this limit, divide by this. So that could be one function with a flag that says, here's what I want you to divide by, and here's what I want you to get out, you know. Divide by a thousand and use, you know, thousands, millions, and, and 
billions or divide by 1024 and use k meg gig. Um, and then uh, the display and the calculations are not separate at all. So I'll just, I can quickly go to here and see um, my SQL tuner dot pi actually pi dot slash my SQL tuner dot pl. Um, so if we go here, um, basically you know, here it's calculating. You know here it's actually. Um, showing you, you know, here's the prunes per day, and then it goes to the sorting section. So then it calculates, and then it's going to, you know, it's going to print that stuff, and it's all in that same together. So there's no reason that we should have that. So that's where it is. Um, there's been a lot of work put into it. There's a lot more that needs to be done, obviously. And I was just wondering if anybody thinks this is useful, not useful, what would you love to see most in it? Does this make you want to go out and use even the older version of the one that's there? Or? You have to admit that getting it via MySQL tuner.pl is convenient, so maybe you should submit the yeah, back to yeah, it. yeah. We are we're we're definitely gonna do some we're gonna definitely do something like that, or just you know I mean I haven't really you know I don't know if he's really um, updating it a lot, so he might just want to say oh you just update it and we'll just do it there. So um, anything else? Who's who who's here is actually thinking of going to use it on their machine now, either the new one or the old one? Nobody, great. I'm glad you all had a great hour listening to me talk. Um, and uh, two people, no, that's great. Um, when are you going to put this in uh, Launchpad? Where am I going to put it in when? Launchpad? When? I will put it within a week. Um, because I do have to figure out, like, is, you know, what is, what is, like, I don't want to make a separate project if I can keep it with, you know, WGET, MySQL, PL, so. And he's got a subversion repository, I think, as well, right? Yeah, but Launchpad is, is better because you can have bugs and, and yeah, yeah. you know, and mailing lists and stuff Encouraging right there. to move off. There is a there is a mailing list for this MySQL tuner thing too, right? On Google. Yeah, but it's but it's like Google, and again, it's like Google, and yeah. it's not you know there's bug track there's not bug tracking, so and you know I don't want to say oh you should do this. I'd rather say hey you know what I'd really love to see this, and I'm willing to put the work into it to do it. So that's kind of like I wanted to, you know, to deal with that. So all right, well if you guys have any ideas, um, feel free to contact me. Um, Again, my name is uh, Shiri Cabral, which was at the beginning of the slides. Um, I'll actually put the slides up on uh, on uh, probably the Open SQL camp. A link from there, um, or FrostCon if I can. Um, but uh, basically, my first name is S H E T R I, and if you go to Shiri.com, you can upload uh, to the slideshow. <laughs> no, not not to the. Oh, of course, uh, you can upload uh, to the slideshow, but also in the. Oh, in the in the presentation itself. In the presentation itself. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I'll do that. But if you forget or you I don't know you don't go to Frostcon the whatever you can always go to Shiri.com. That's how I remember it. Um, just tweet. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you guys very much for sitting and listening to me jabber on for an hour.